Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode on the channel. I'm Dr. Nasser. I'm here today with you guys to do a rapid internal medicine board review. This is for mostly for the ABIM, but you're going to see a lot of topics in general from even step one and these that keep getting tested in these board exams. Okay. There's a lot more on the slides that I'm going to have time to explain. And this is going to be a rapid review. I'm going to focus on very high yield parts of each of these topics that get tested. But you can pause the video and read the slides on your own when you're reviewing. Okay, so we're going to jump into this very fast and effective studying method. If you enjoy this, don't forget to comment and subscribe. Okay, guys, let's. All right, the first one, the IT band syndrome. The most important pair is that don't image it. The diagnosis is clinical. And remember that usually they're going to give you an athlete. It's a runner. And they will have that pain on the lateral aspects of the knee that is worsened with activity. And the best thing is to exercise modify for as the first line, reduce that aggravating effect and do a lot of targeted physical therapy, T-band stretching and hip abduction. Next one, HSP guys, can you believe it? Still getting tested on ABIM. I have not seen a single case of HSP. The most important findings are that very important. Remember that pain in the abdomen, which is very colicky. The pathophysiology is the vasculitis and inflammation of the vessels in the mesentery, which are the vessels that feed into the organs which can actually mimic surgical emergency. So they try to give you differential diagnosis that goes with this. A lot of these patients have that purpuric rash on the lower extremities, and then they may even develop glomerulonephritis, which could be microscopic hematuria all the way to severe nephritis and a presentation of ESRD to 10 to 30% of these patients. And the pathophysiology is that a glycosylation of IgA1 and formation of immune complexes. And so the way they like to test this is that the skin biopsy for these patients is the most sensitive and specific test which will show leukocytoclastic vasculitis with IgA deposition in small vessels okay very high yield don't forget all right next one we're going to go to acute gout I know this topic is, keeps coming up but this one is actually a very important clinical period I'm going to talk to you about of course you know that intraarticular steroids would be the safest when you have a monoarthritic gout in a CKD patient and you are you have them on punal for prevention by the low dose. But remember, if these patients are have very severe gout that only gets managed with strong NSAIDs, and in the past they may have been replaced with colchicine, a lot of patients forget to stop taking that colchicine after that acute episode. And what happens is they continue taking this colchicine and they have renal insufficiency for other reasons, for example. And the colchicine actually build up in their body and present as a myositis kind of picture, but in effectively it's called neuromyopathy. It presents as a proximal muscle weakness and elevated CK levels. And this is the hallmark of the colchicine-induced neuromyopathy, which histologically you can find cytoplasmic vacuolization, okay, on that muscle biopsy. And another pathognomonic finding is that as soon as you take them off the colchicine, their symptoms will resolve. All right. The next thing is Zanker's diverticulum. The way they like to test this one is they want you to know the first line, okay, for someone presenting with halitosis, a neck mass, uh, food getting trapped, food regurgitation, recurrent aspiration pneumonia, the first line is an esophagram. They don't want you to jump into an EGD because remember that EGD or an, even an NG2 placement can lead to perforated diverticulum, this risk means your first line is going to have to be still the barium assault. Next one, Mallory Weiss there, that longitudinal mucosal laceration that happens when you retch a lot for, let's say, bulimia reason, alcohol consumption. So 24, 40 hours after this, you want to do an endoscopy, which would be diagnostic and therapeutic. And I'll tell you here, endoscopy, Usually when they do that, they can do epinephrine injection and cautery and even put hemoglobin to stop their active bleeding. And then remember that PPI is not going to be helpful in this case. And also, you can still do endoscopy if these patients are anticoagulated, okay? If their INR is less than 2.5, okay? I want you to remember that. All right. The next one, cellulitis. Why did I include this? I want you to remember the Clinda and TMP, TMP SMX for your regular cellulitis, which is not as purulent and doesn't have an abscess or any sort of complication. Usually it's caused by strep species. But if you are having 
other signs of pus, abscess formation, things like that, you need to be thinking about MRSA coverage. And remember, if you have someone who has been has a bite wound, you also need to provide anaerobic coverage to for the polymicrobial nature of it. The next one is hyperkalemia. Everybody knows hyperkalemia presentation with T, peak T bakes, but you also have to know based on the levels of hyperkalemia, you may have PR interval prolongation, you may have P wave flattening and disappears, then even QRS whitening all the way to sinus wave, all the way to asystole. So sometimes the boards will not give you the pick team. If they may show you the PR interval pro prolongation in a patient with CKD that has acute renal failure on top, they want you to be able to tend that on the EKG and recognize this is hyperkalemia. For example, like if, if the hyperkalemia is significant to that point of QRS widening, of course, after you give the gluconate and calcium chloride, you can start with insulin and glucose for the, the rapid shift that you need, okay? And then you can add other therapies. Heart failure, they love this topic. They want you to know the diagnosis, the understanding of it with the LVF of less than 35%. But usually they want you to know about the spironolactone and furone providing mortality benefit in HFREF beyond that achieved with the beta blockers and ASI. But remember to be careful in patients who have significant renal dysfunction and the point is battening clearance less than 30 or hyperkalemia with the potassium that is already greater than five prior to starting these medications, okay? And of course, the order that of importance comes, I would say the beta blocker, the ASI, ARBs, and then your RNAs and uh, mineral, uh, mineral corticoreceptor antagonists for these patients. The next one, I want you to take OSA obstructive sleep apnea very seriously because it can present with all of these findings, bradycardia, tachyarrhythmia, long pauses, apneic episodes, ventricular arrhythmias, AFib. So the clinical peril that I want you to remember is the psycho. The apnea leading to hypoxemia, first getting a vagal tone, becoming bradycardic, then termination of the apnea, you will get a sympathetic surge. That is where the catecholamine is released and you are at very high risk of these tachyarrhythmias and patients must get diagnosed and must wear their CPAP, which studies shows 90% reduction in nocturnal arrhythmias. Okay, very important to know and take it very seriously in your patients. PAD, of course, the ABI normal is 1 to 1.3. Anything less than equal to 0.9, that is very sensitive and specific for a PAD. Anything greater than 1.3, so just non-compressible vessels or significant arterial calcifications, which is common in diabetes uh, and CKD patients. And so in those patients, you may need to do other testing, such as toe brachial index or alternative vascular images like a CTA, if the renal function allows. And these are some of the findings. But again, I want you to know that ABI, the use and the differential diagnosis, unlike neurogenic claudication from spinal stenosis, which is relieved by sitting and leaning forward, these patients' vascular claudication is reliably relieved by stopping activity while remaining in the same position. And they will try to get you on this. Again, going back to a systolic dysfunction, but I want to talk about asymptomatic patients with systolic dysfunction. We have seen that ACE inhibitors in these asymptomatic patients reduce the incidence of heart failure by 37% and heart failure hospitalization by 36%. Of course, beta blockers provide benefit in patients who have history of MI, but I want you to know, unlike in symptomatic heart failure, where you have loop diuretics and that you add on, do not add it in the patients who are asymptomatic. All right, so ICD for primary prevention. So the timing of the ICD implantation is critical in post-MI patients. Multiple trials have shown no benefit if you start ICDs early on after an MI. These trials have demonstrated significant mortality reduction with ICD therapy when implanted at least 40 days post-MI and three months post-revascularization. Okay, so for patients with borderline criteria, you can do electrophysiologic studies to help risk stratify them. And then another way they try to get you, they may tell you, oh, the patient has just had an MI and now they're symptomatic. They may tell you they get dizzy when standing. But those are related to probably autonomic dysfunction or the new medications they were starting on. That doesn't qualify these patients to be a candidate for ICD therapy. Next thing that sometimes we forget about, but very commonly tested on all the step exams, all the way to ABIM, and I've seen it in rheumatology clinics a lot, 
are patients who can present with a vascular necrosis, the femoral head, the presentation with a pain in the groin that can radiate to the buttocks, knees, and the lateral thigh. And it can present, like the patient is fine, they come to you and say, hey, I have pain in my groin. When I do a lot of activities, a pain that you may not even take seriously if you're not, you don't have this diagnosis on your radar. So very important to know that early on, you need MRI, not an X-ray. That X-ray with the crescent sign will show in the later stages. And the MRI is nearly 100% sensitive for early AVN. And remember, risk factors for having AVN would be your chronic steroid users, post, especially renal transplant, immune suppressions, patients who use alcohol frequently, post-trauma patients, and take it very seriously. This diagnosis, do not miss a growing pain diagnosis like that. And the next important thing is that teriparatide is the only FDA-approved anabolic agent, which means that it will help build new bone rather than prevent the bone resorption. It increases the bone mineral density way more rapidly than your general regular bisphosphonase. And the two-year treatment limitation is very important. These patients should not be more than two years on teriparatide because we have seen increased risk of osteosarcoma in rats in the preclinical trials. But you need to remember, after you complete teriparatide, patients should transition into anti-resorptive treatments to maintain the gains in the bone density. A lot of times patients will be on teriparatide for that period of time or on a bisphosphonate for a period of time, and then suddenly their provider stops it. And these patients develop very low bone densities. And these bone densities are very significant. For example, this patient, like this bone density of negative 3.5, a lot of times, you see this in patients who've been on bisphosphonates for a long time and they were, for no reason, they were stopped. And that took them down to negative 3.5. Now these patients are candidate for teriparatide. And that's where teriparatide will become very important. The next thing I want you to remember is polymyalgia rheumatica. Polymyalgia means there's pain in the shoulder and hip girl. Rheumatica is rheumatologic, that morning stiffness, 30 minutes. You'll see it in a lot more in females and older allies. They're going to have inflammatory markers. There is a higher presentation of GCA. These patients rapidly respond to low-dose prednisone, but this is how they get you. They tell you, oh, the patient started on prednisone for the, in the last 10 days and their symptoms have resolved. And so what do you do? Do not stop prednisone in these patients. The treatment is a slow steroid tape over one to two years. Otherwise, these patients can go back and relapse. And remember, these patients need to continue to be monitored for GCA. You will be continuously asking them about symptoms of jugular education, headache, visual disturbance, and or any temporal headaches, scalp tenderness in the occipital areas. Very important to rule that out and screen for it. Next thing, STL2Is are a very favorite medication for all of us in medicine now. For example, in patients with diabetic kidney disease, right? We use these to prevent progression. But the important key point now that gets into the details, but boards now are going into the details, if they want you to know, if you start a patient on SGLT2I and their GFR drops by about 5 milliliter a minute after starting SGLT2I, that's a hemodynamic change. It's not a structural damage to the kidneys. So do not stop the SGLT2I. This actual initial decline has been linked to a long-term renal protection, per se. So it's actually a good sign, all right? Next one. Remember, patients with rheumatoid arthritis have shown very good benefits when they start on a TNF inhibitor, right? And the risk of developing latent TB is pretty high when you start these patients on TNF inhibitors, right? So the risk of that is Again, various per type of agents of monoclonal antibodies like infliximab and limumab, those have the higher risk than the soluble etanercept. But the extrapulmonary and disseminated TB are more common with that TNF inhibitors than typical reactivation. So if you see a patient with extrapulmonary symptoms, the disseminated findings, that probably the reason is with the TNF inhibitors. Okay. Now, you may have a false negative TB skin test. So get always the IGRAs as a test. And for patients with a positive screening, you need to start isoniazid treatment at least one month before starting the TNF inhibitors. And then to get a little bit more detail that gets tested on boards. HEPB reactivation can also happen 
and can be severe and potentially fatal, which requires to use antiviral prophylaxis in patients who have hep B surface antigen positive. So that's a little higher level question that can get tested. But vertebral compression fractures, they commonly get tested and they want you to know how to manage it. So the most important thing is that don't tell these patients to rest too much. More than that first one, one day or two days of because of pain, do not tell them to bed rest because we have seen more complications when they stay in bed. Prolonged immobilization has led to actual accelerated bone loss, muscle deconditioning, and risk of complications with pneumonia, DVTs, ulcers, okay? You can use calcitonin nasal spray to, to, for a rapid analgesic effect if you, of course, tried the NSAID, astaminophen, and all those things that didn't really help or the pain was very severe. They help very fast in the acute phase. And remember to always start these patients on bisphosphonates if you think this patient have osteoporosis risk. And presence of symmetrically diminished ankle reflexes in someone who is elderly, it's pretty common, okay? Do not necessarily tell you that this patient has a nerve root compression requiring more imaging. So they may tell you, oh, this patient had vertical compression fracture and now they have the diminished reflexes and they want to push you into getting more imaging because or doing something more invasive because you think this is a more severe. But do not do that, okay? And lastly, the GPA, the most important thing is that sometimes you get the like, ankle levels or the C ankle or anti-PR3, but the patient has clinical presentation that's typical, but then your ankle panel comes back negative. A negative ankle panel does not rule out this vascularity. Same for other ankle vascular disease. And while the C ankle and the anti-PR3 very highly associated with GPA and that P ankle anti-MPO with microscopic polyangiitis, there is significant overlap also. So that means that sometimes you may have clinical presentation of GPA, but you have a positive P angle. But don't change your diagnosis to the microscopic polyangiitis. Go with your clinical presentation, not your markers. Okay, they, a lot on the boards, they will try to get you on you picking a diagnosis based on a marker being present or not, or then making you ignore your clinical judgment. Okay, do not fall in this. Trap. And this is the last slide, guys. I hope you enjoyed. If you stay to the end of the video, please like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what other topics you want me to cover. This is our third rapid internal medicine review. And these are very high yield topics covered on the boards. I'll see you guys on the next